Welcome to this latest Author Hub webinar, uh, Distal Femur Fractures, Everything You Need to Know. As always, we've got an awesome faculty right there. Uh, just a cheeky bit of housekeeping, bear with me, I'll keep this as short as I can, I promise. Um, my name's Peter Bates. Um, uh, Author Hub have been doing a load of work recently, uh, trying to put out some cool content, trying to put out stuff that's interesting, a little bit challenging. Check out this podcast, video podcast with Sui Yang, like well, the stuff that she's gone through. Uh, it's, it's pretty inspiring. Uh, we talked to Andy Williams, that's all the podcast is out, talking about, you know, treating uh, film stars and like elite athletes and all these like, you know, uh, so premiership players, uh, you know, what's it like treating them and managing their sports injuries. We did some cool stuff with Tom Quick, uh, brachial plexus, uh, uh, nerve examination, we've done upper limb, we're going to do lower limb shortly, uh, so that should be out very soon. Uh, Anish Sang Sangarajka, we did, uh, you know, pediatric elbow, understanding the, 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 the elbow x-rays, again, Beautiful stuff for, for trainees, just like six minutes of just like lovely, really, really explains it nicely. Why do you do arthrograms? Things like that. Uh, as always with AuthorHub, we have to, to thank our sponsors. Uh, AuthorHub do not actually make any money. So uh, we, we, uh, um, we're, we're a non-profit at the moment. And uh, so we, we are reliant on our sponsors. And to Pew have, have, have uh, kindly sponsored this. Uh, importantly, I would say... Um, They've not asked us to uh, product place or say anything nice about them or anything like that. They've just uh, just come to the party just to be affiliated with it. So thank you very much to our sponsors. Uh, next week, we're doing Distal Radius, How to Stay Out of Trouble. Similarly, awesome faculty, uh, uh, great lineup uh, talking about Distal Radius. But today it's Distal Femur, and that's who we've got. We've got Jane from Coventry, we've got Greg Della Rocca, but not from Minnesota, from, from uh, Missouri. <laughs> Apparently that's like calling someone from Scotland, they're, they're, they're English, it's like total, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, uh, so Greg, apologies for that massive typo. Uh, and Ennis Gurriel from, uh, from Brighton. So thank you so much to our faculty. Uh, as always, uh, guys, stick, stick your cameras on briefly so you can wave at, wave at the guys. I did so, I, about two weeks before this webinar, I asked the faculty, just like, give me like a little factoid, a little like thing about yourself. Because normally at this point, you like start boring on about like how many awards they've won and what they've done. And like, you know, oh my God, it goes on and on and everyone falls asleep. So I thought one fact that's kind of interesting about you and you never know what you're going to get. It's like, you know, it's like sort of like dipping a box at your hand in the, in the, in the quality street. So what do we get from Jane? She's, it's like a pre Previous celebrity TV chef. She's, uh, she, I think she was a green tomato. Was it a red one? I'm not quite sure. I don't think she did very well. <laughs> uh, Greg is a is, is a is a soccer is a soccer guy. He's a keepy uppy champion. He's also into into eighties eighties uh, pop trivia. So at the end of this, if we've got time at the end, he's threatening to do a, like a quiz and stuff where you know all the all the like you got to name all the members of Duran Duran and that kind of thing. And uh, Ennis. Uh, yeah, this one's pretty niche. Uh, underwater toilet photographer. You're gonna you're gonna have to DM him separately on that one because I, you know, I <laughs> I, I, I don't want to. Whatever I say, I think it's gonna come out wrong. <laughs> uh, those are their topics. Just before we get on to the the the, the topics we're going to talk about, I'm going to do a little cameo on uh, retrograde femoral nails. Uh, it's one of those. It's, the reason I'm doing this is because uh, it, there's still quite a bit of uh, con controversy is probably the wrong word, but a variation in behavior. A lot of people have different responses to retrograde femininals, as you will see in just a second. Um, but I think I I'm just going to talk about what they are, what the indications are, and, 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 and what the controversies are. So here we go. Retrograde femoral nails, very briefly. Uh, Whenever you're going to uh, talk about retrograde nails, I think it's, it's worth knowing what the indications are. What are the ind the classic indications? I've just lined them all up here. Patients who are very big uh, or pregnant, it's often helpful because moving moving that patient into a lateral nose to an anterograde femoral nail is very very difficult. Uh, very distally based fractures, fractures that open around the knee, those are uh, those are potential indications. Patients with uh, spinal injuries where the anesthesia guys are, are worried, I think that's probably less of a big deal nowadays. People are more comfortable with uh, log rolls and uh, moving patients uh, with spinal injuries. 
patients who are having other stuff done around their knees. So they've got a patella fracture or they've got a, an ipsilateral tibia. So you're going there anyway. Again, that's another relative indication. Patients who've had uh, a, a acetabular fracture on the same side, and, and that's going to require a coccolangobic, you might decide to do a retrograde in order to keep the, the tissues up around the buttock um, uh, un, un, unaffected. And of course, it's great for polytrauma. People who've broken everything, that's a bit of an aging slide, I have to say. You don't usually see that kind of thing nowadays. But um, uh, patients who, who, um, uh, uh, who are polytraumatized, the beauty of that is that you can, you can, uh, you can be operating all over the, operating on their distal radius at the same time as you're nailing their femur, and then you're debriding the wound on their foot. Uh, you, you can get, get at all of them, and retrograde is very, very compelling in that setting. Um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, oh yeah, no, I, I use it quite a bit in this setting as well. The the um, uh, the ipsilateral femoral neck and shaft. Sorry, I'm fighting with the technology here. Uh, where you've got you're fixing your femoral neck with one implant and you're fixing your shaft with another, and that fits with a retrograde quite nicely. Obviously, there are a huge number of like individual solutions for that particular fracture type, and so I'm, I'm not going to go into that. But it's just one one of the potential options. So. Um, um, I think for anyone who's who's watching as a trainee, who's like got maybe got the exam coming up, that list is quite good to have in the back of your head. The list of standard indications for retrograde femoral nail is quite a useful like list to know. Okay, cool. Um, it is a bit quicker. It is easier. At least it is it in my hands. Uh, getting your entry point, getting it absolutely correct, uh, is 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 easy as well uh, as is doing all the reaming and stuff. So I find it is is generally speaking an easier a, a thing to do. Uh, People talk about violation. I'm not going to uh, thrash that word too hard uh, because it has all sorts of emotional connotations. But when you're putting that reamer into the trochlea, you do feel it's true. You are violating the knee, no, no doubt about it. But when you like do a humeral nail, you're violating like, uh, the rotator cuff insertion. When you uh, do, a, do an anti-grade nail, you're violating the um, uh, the uh, gluteus medius insertion. So there is there is. Uh, there is a degree of violation in any nailing pr procedure. And of course, you know, we all know this now, but if, if just in case you're in any doubt, the outcomes of retrograde versus antigrade. Retrograde nails have been around since the, since the early 90s. They have been around a long, long time. And there's a huge number of studies out there. Um, I've just picked like, like five or six right there. Um, and, but there's a huge wealth of them. Interestingly, we don't have a good, uh, like large number, Mobandari style RCT comparing antigrade versus retrograde. They're mainly a uh, case series or small comparative series. But basically most authors are finding exactly the same thing. That yes, retrograde femoral have a slightly higher instance of knee pain and antigrade femoral have a slightly higher degree of hip pain. So exactly as you'd expect. Um, but funk, but you know, when you look at their function, when you look at union rates, when you look at all of the all of the other outcomes, uh, quality of life, etc., uh, there's, there's there's total equivalence across the board. What about over time? What about long term? Uh, well, Brewster, uh, I, the reason I put this one in because they they were looking at five to fifteen year follow up uh, uh, published a couple of years ago. Again, there's a huge number of studies, but this was just one that I picked out. Um, again, comparing antigrade versus retrograde, and there was, there was equivalence at five to fifteen year follow up. So I don't think we are giving these patients patellofemoral osteoarthritis, at least we've no evidence of that yet. What it really needs is a big ass RCT. Um, but interesting, I'm, I'm not sure the appetite is out there because I think people recognize that, 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 it, that the, the difference that would, would you, you know, the number you would require in order to show a difference would be massive. And I think that's why people perhaps haven't got, gone that, that, that far. Uh, uh, one of the things that makes that makes uh, retrogrades bad outcomes is prominence. If you've got prominence, your medial lot of your of your lat distal locus, same with antigrade, uh, th then that will cause them pain. And if it's prominent in the in the knee, that defo causes causes pain. Interestingly, though, and this is important, however you nail the femur, patients often get knee pain. Antigrade femoral nails still yield knee pain. And it's probably something to do with just the way the quads get defunctioned or tethered down or whatever it is. But in some way, knee pain is a feature of all nail, all fe femur fractures to some degree. Um, obviously, it's, there are limitations to retrogrades. There's no cephalomedullary option. Uh, and you have these worries about knee. What if the knee gets, what if the nail gets infected? You're taking out through the knee. Well, yeah, you are. And you're going to, to have to wash out the knee at the same time. So there are definitely concerns. And I think that's why it's not the jury's out. It's just that clinicians kind of separate into what they're comfortable with and what they're not. Um, 
So here's an example, 56 year old who slipped in the shower. So this is a sort of fragility style fracture. You can see that spiral extension coming down. Um, uh, so we decided to go for a retrograde. This is how I personally do a retrograde. So th there she's on table. You can see there's a little bump under her, under her right bump. That's a loosened bump, not a sandbag. Otherwise it can interfere with your proximal locking if you get it in the wrong place. And the round bump, you can move up and down to change the version. I've blatantly stolen that picture from, uh, from the internet. Um, but uh, you can see me doing that exact thing. You see on the top picture, you can see that there's a bit of a sag. You can see there's a bit of a sag in the femur there. And as I move the bump upwards, that turns into an anterior bow. And when you anterior bow the femur, that's when the reduction tends to come on. Uh, so here we go. The patient's in that position, all, all prepped up, ready to go. I've driven, I've drawn my uh, my uh, sad, sleepy face on the front, and that's kind of where the decision goes. We went pretty meepo here with this presentation in mind, uh, and so th uh, there's the there's the entry point. Uh, you don't have to make a massive exposure. You don't have to see it with your eyes. It's a percutaneous operation, certainly in my hands, at least. Uh, the guide wire goes in to find your entry point on a lateral. You can see we're on a lateral there, uh, and that's what it should look like on AP and lateral bang in the middle on AP and at the confluence of trochlea and, and Blumenstadt's line on the lateral, that right at that apex of the V. Uh, there's your, your entry point Rima going in. Uh, then then what this is how do you get your guide wire across? Well, obviously your guide wire's got a little hook on the end and, and a little contour to help you across. But the way of reducing uh, in, in, the, in, in this setting is just, you can see with his left hand, he's holding the distal femur and pulling down, giving a bit of traction, but he's also pulling downwards into the table, which brings where the bump is, it kind of forces the femur down over the bump and that stretches the femur anteriorly, which often brings on an nice reduction. Uh, and then when you're measuring, you're measuring somewhere up just above the uh, lesser trochanter. The nail has a femoral bow. All nails on the market have some kind of anterior femoral bow. So you've got to start low and you're coming up as you go. Um, uh, proximal locking. I'll ask the faculty about proximal locking, about any tips and tricks. This is one, if you're not, if you, you want to, like some kind of sleeve to drill down that's radio lucent, you can use a five mil syringe, chop the top off, and you can see they're going through there. One thing uh, I, I've seen the trainees do quite a bit is if you've got your round holes and you put your drill down, but if you miss the drill and you go doof and you hit the nail, what you can do is take the drill off and then go, ah, yeah, I need to go a little bit over here. And then you move the, the drill and then you doof, 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 knock it in with a, with a hammer, make sure you're inside the nail, then you can reattach your drill and complete the back cortex. Um, uh, for getting a lateral at the top end, once you've locked up and you just want that last final view, you could do what I would call a look back lateral where your, your, your uh, eye is slight, not completely lateral, but maybe 20 degrees off. And it's also slightly internally rotated as you can see, and that gives you really nice lateral down the, uh, the proximal end. And that's where you are at the end with a, with a nice sort of, uh, minimally invasive uh, surgery. Uh, before you do your proximal locking, you need to check your rotation ideally. So you get an AP of the, of the good side and then and the AP of the knee, and then you run your X-ray up and you get an AP of the hip and you save those two views. You then go to your the side you're nailing, which has not yet been proximally locked. You get the same AP of the knee and then you run your, your, your thing up uh, and, then, and then you, uh, and you get the, um, the view at the top. And, and, and basically what you're looking for is, is symmetrical lesser trochanters. The lesser trochanters should match each other. Remember, you're, when you're doing the, the ordinary side, you need to flex up the knee while you do it. So you get, a, you get equivalent views. Uh, uh, there's, there's Bloomerstat's line coming across there and the nail has to be inside the trochlea. See the corner of the nail, right? Just inside that blue out, that bottom blue arrow, just, just, just there. Um, so that, and that, that's, that's the ideal spot for it. One thing I would avoid is going, oh, well, I'll knock it in a little bit further, particularly in the fragility setting, because the best bone in that patient's distal femur is in that bottom inch. So you want to get as many locking screws in that bit as possible. The more you knock your nail in, the more you're getting up into that metaphyseal bone, which doesn't really hold good, uh, good, uh, uh, doesn't hold good, good grip at all. Best bone is actually at the trochlea. Um, here's how not to do it. So here you can see your trochlea and you can see the nail poking out. And this patient will not be flexing their knee beyond like 20 degrees or so. You can see they, they, uh, they, they uh, did a, a, a distal, they, they, they locked it dynamically, which is a, a curious decision. Uh, but in order to know whether you're in that sweet spot or not, whether you're in that, you need to get an absolutely perfect lateral. So two femoral condyles perfectly overlapping each other, make, take a bit of time getting this right and getting this right until you've got your lateral is absolutely perfect. And then you can assess where the level of the nail is. Great. So I'm gonna stop there on retrograde nails and just invite the rest of the faculty back in just to chat about what their uh, 
uh, experiences of, of retrogrades and not experience of it, but like what the usage is in their um, in their uh, in their practice. Uh, guys, uh, Greg, should, should we start? Should we start with you, Greg? Have you got any tips for proximal locking that you you tell your trainees when they're because a lot of people get freaked out by the proximal locking? Any any yeah. tips for? Yeah, fan, great question. I have I have actually two things that I wanted to point out. Um, so uh, proximal locking shouldn't be much more difficult than uh, than standard freehand locking that you would do, for example, in the distal femur during anterograde nailing, or in the distal tibia during standard tibia nailing. Okay, so the difference, of course, uh, for the proximal locks with retrograde nails is you're going front to back. So a couple of things just to be aware of is that there are crossing branches of the femoral nerve uh, in the general vicinity of where the proximal interlocking screw would be placed. And they have fairly substantial blood vessels that go with them. And so when you make your incision in the skin, I would avoid taking the knife and going all the way down to bone. Uh, I will usually just incise the skin itself and then I'll spread with uh, some type of a soft tissue forceps down to bone and then put the drill in place. So that's just one thing I would recommend. And uh, I think uh, that wisdom that I have comes from a very bad experience with a former trainee who went down to bone uh, with a knife. And then uh, the patient probably lost close to half a liter of blood by the time we were able to get control of what had been lacerated. So not a good day. Um, so that's one thing. The second, the second thing to note is that uh, I really, really liked your description of removing the power from the drill bit itself, if you notice that you've gone through your first cortex and then the drill bit has bumped into the nail, uh, then you can use your hands to wiggle the drill bit to put it through the nail and then reattach your, uh, reattach your power and then continue through the opposite side. I would, uh, I would say that generally using a, a hammer to do that as well is probably reasonable. But I would counsel people, especially when you get into the elderly population, especially in the distal tibia, when you're doing tibia nailing, to be careful using that mallet to put the drill bit through the other side, because I've seen the mallet put the drill bit not only through to the other cortex, but out through the other cortex. And then you've lost and you've blown your proximal interlock. So those are just a couple of things that I would mention. Awesome. Cheers, Greg. That's brilliant. Uh, uh, Ennis, say. Yeah, I just uh, on one of your slides I noticed, and it's quite a common problem with the distal femoral nail, is the, the very slight various values you can get with your alignment. Uh, and I find often you have to consider using a blocking screw quite frequently with um, distal femoral nails, unless you've got a perfectly transverse fracture pattern. Um, so it's just worth having a low threshold for, for correcting that alignment. If I've, I've got a picture of that, um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's right. Because uh, the, the, it's, it, it's just uh, in, a, in a big metaphysis. Uh, what, what do you use, Ellis? Are you blocking screws? I'm, I must say, I'm a blocking wire uh, kind of. I, I tend to use wires and then lock it all up, and then the wires come out. But I, I, what's your, what's your, uh, Jane? No, I was just going to ask Ellis the same thing. If there was a question in the chat about, you know, with these really big, wide metaphysis and you're putting these skinny nails in, what can you do? And you also, you've got your blocking screws to help your reduction. But sometimes what I do is after the nails in, to sort of narrow the, the canal is add some extra AP screws. And then I would leave them as screws rather than wires. So you get a bit of a snugger fit with your nail all the way down. Yeah, no, I'll try and do that with one here. So try and use the blocking screws that then end up being your small screws as well. And then yeah. some, some some of the implants that exist have got have got newer uh, newer targeting options. So uh, so there are obliquely oriented screws for some of the more current generation retrograde nails that you can use to improve axial stability. Um, some of the some of the current nails have actually got uh, uh, ceramic or polyether ether ketone inserts within the uh, within the interlocking holes so it creates more of a fixed angle type of device for the interlocking screws some nails actually have uh, end caps which uh, for me end caps primarily represent a method by which my equipment representatives earn more money uh, <laughs> yes. but it but in some cases uh, the end cap will will actually 
uh, interfere with the distal interlocking screw, and that can create more of a fixed angle implant in that location yeah. as well. Yeah, so it's almost turning yeah into a fixed angle device. Uh, just I don't know if, if you can put me on full screen color just uh, briefly. I uh, just got a, a, a little thing of where dis where blocking screws go in the distal femur. Uh, you can see, yeah uh, just just for a second. So you can see on on the AP that's usually the one that's that's problematic, or that you can get uh, flexion or indeed extension. Um, uh, but you can see uh, basically blocking screws or blocking wires go where the nail currently is. So if you're if you're if you're malreduced, the blocking wire needs to go where your nail right is is right now. The technique I generally use is I put my wire onto the nail where I think it goes. So in this state, on, on that right hand side, would be A, and I hit the nail. Doof! I hit the nail, and then you back the nail out, and then you advance the wire, and then the nail comes back in. Now he's got to find his way around the wire, and that that does your correction. And by using wires, you can, you can, you know, if one doesn't quite cut it, you could use another one. And then you could, you know, you, you, if you've been too greedy, you can move it this way. And if you've not been greedy enough, you can move it that way. And you can have a few goes at it. Whereas a blocking screw tends to be much more definitive and either it works or it doesn't work. And it can, you know, common you out if you're trying to bully the nail past it. Um, I, I, I don't uh, anyone, anyone's thoughts on that before we, before we move on on, on that. No, I just remember finding it really hard, especially for the FRCS, about working out where you're going to put your blocking screws. Because obviously, when you're doing your exam, your brain goes and all this <sighs> convex, concave <laughs> stuff just doesn't work it. So for me, I, I always remember that maybe I was taught that nails are like teenagers or maybe like you, Pete, is they, they go out early and then they come back late. They're going to take the, <laughs> the path of least resistance. So you're going to block it exactly. And if yeah. you draw a line straight down the medullary canal and draw your fracture, you want to put it on the acute angle angle on both sides of the fracture and for me with the whole convex concave thing which used to confuse me I found that was easier yeah okay guys I'm going to put you on the spot here I, I, this is nothing to do with distal femur but um uh so fit and healthy healthy office worker isolated injuries soft tissue is good CT shows the femoral neck is good so that so that is just a, an out and out mid shaft femur if anything I, I made it like I I, I Lately, took this off the internet. I've chosen one that's slightly more proximal shaft, just to just to take the piss a bit. I'll I'll go first. I just to, I, just to fess up. In my practice, if if the if the trainees wanted to go anti grade, I go anti grade. They want to go retrograde, I go retrograde. So if, if, with all else else being equal, and no other reason to do one or the other, I would generally go uh, retrograde most times for these. I would go retrograde just because it's easier and quicker. I'm not totally sold on, you know, like married to the technique, but I think for a, something that I know is going to be stable afterwards, I would go retrograde. What, uh, what about the rest of you guys? Yeah, I've got a much lower threshold for going retrograde as well. Definitely always ask the trainees what it is they need to get access to, but it is much easier. The setup, that's what really takes the time, is the setup and the entry point. If you're going to do your anti-grade, you're going to do it on traction. I mean, you put a, a morbidly obese uh, patient in your talk, but even if you've got like a healthy person with muscle, trying to get that even trochanteric, even that rather than more than a piriformis entry point, can still be tricky. Whereas if you go retrograde, you've got a lot more flexibility, you've got a whole load more techniques open to you to do a close reduction and, and it's just a, a lot simpler just a little proviso so i had one of these recently in a patient with a spinal injury where there was a lot of discussion around who was going to go first and i thought we were going to go first so i was going to do a retrograde nail like you said um and actually when i measured it um the fracture was very slightly more proximal than that one um but there was an uh, undisplaced sort of crackette going up towards the left trochanter but when I measured it, it was longer than our longest retrograde nail. So one thing to remember is the anterograde nails are longer generally than the retrograde nails. So just so you're not locking it just above the fracture. Yeah, so I would suggest that uh, this, this fracture would be an anterograde nail for me. I think a retrograde nail would work well, assuming this uh, patient is not 10 feet tall. I agree with Ennis there. Um, but uh, yeah, I do agree that the setup for most anti-grade nails, if you're using a fracture table or a traction table, is uh, probably takes quite a bit of time. Um, but I personally do free leg nailing both anti-grade and retrograde techniques, and so uh, so for me, the setup is no less uh, is no more or less time consuming uh, based upon where the uh, where I'm going to be putting the nail. So. Um, so yeah, but I think a retrograde nail would work perfectly well in this. You want to make sure that you get your retrograde nail up as at the tip of the nail up as far as you can into the antitrochanteric region, uh, both to reduce the likelihood of having a fracture in that area by having a nail end right in the subtroch region, but 
but also you want to maximize the working length of the nail where you're putting your interlock interlocks in to get them as proximal as you can to the fracture itself. Totally agree on that, and and uh, and you and you absolutely need to, as with all uh, proximal, more proximal uh, uh, femur fractures, you want to make sure you don't leave them in any kind of varus. So uh, you, if your nail is straying off towards the grace trochanter, you've got to back it off and and maybe even use blocking wires to send it more medial, or just go anti grace. Cool. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Um, let's move on to uh, Jane. Jane, uh, take us through your talk. Right, here we go. So uh, I was very reassuring actually to hear your talk, Pete, because uh, it means that uh, I'm actually doing retrograde nails in exactly the same fashion. So I feel I must be doing something right. And I just wanted to reiterate how important the lateral x-ray and that sandbag, or I use a sandbag, under the Ips lateral buttock is so you can get a true lateral x-ray. And distal femurs kind of fall, don't they, into to a bimodal distribution. So you've got your young, high mechanism of injury, full off motorbikes, and, and Ennis is going to talk about that. And I get sort of the, the unsexy side of it, which is elderly people that, that fall in their own homes, but are equally important. So we'll look at some cases and then try and draw some new conclusions at the end. This is our 85-year-old lady. AMT is 10. She falls in her own home. And obviously, she's going to be on, on warfarin with an INR of 2 for her atrial fibrillation. And she's got some leg ulcers. They're regularly dressed and they're coming up to her knees. Now, I'm sure you're going to look at that. And your exam answer is going to be, oh, you, you can't understand it. You need to get further imaging. She has to have a CT scan. But our radiographers are good. And there's probably a reason this is the only imaging you've got, because it really, really hurts breaking your femur. I've broken mine. And this is probably the best x-ray you're going to get. So I would just, you know, before you ask for those repeat x-rays, just ask yourself, are you going to gain anything or can you actually take them to theatre and get all the information with traction views in theatre? Most of the time they are going to go into the joint and as long as you have a plan A and a plan B, repeat imaging is not necessarily going to change what you do. All right, so I'm going to tell you that actually this is an extra articular fracture. It's a distal one third. So we are really looking now at retrograde nails or we're looking at a plate. And for those of you who looked at the cases earlier on, there's quite a lot of discussion about whether a nail or plate is going to be better. So what do we do if we're not sure? Well, you know, that's what all these massive RCTs take on. And we can have a look at some evidence. And we certainly had equipoise when it came to the distal tibia in fixed DT, looking at nails versus plates. And there was a feasibility study done called traffics to see whether we had the same amount of equipoise for distal femoral fractures. And interesting, the feasibility study kind of proved it wasn't feasible because we don't have equipoise for the distal femur. We as surgeons have quite a strong preference. This is a fracture I want to nail. and This is a fracture that I want to plate. The other thing that I thought was really interesting about traffics is some of these fractures were managed conservatively. And there was a great question online, you know, would any of you, even during COVID, manage this distal femur conservatively? 100% of you said no, but we know that it does happen from this. So we haven't got the evidence. Do we nail or do we plate it? Well, the surgeon doing this was really concerned about infection because those ulcers are probably going to be exactly where your entry point, just like Pete showed in his photos, are going to be. So the plan was for a lateral plate. And this is, again, some another case. So have a look on what do you think. Because on initial uh, sort of looking, you're like, whoa, this is AO-tastic, isn't it? I mean, it's perfectly reduced, length alignment rotation, you've opened it, you've lagged it anatomically, and you've got this great neutralization lateral locking plate. So all is going to go fine. Well, of course it's not. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here presenting cases which we can all learn from. So what might well happen? Well, certainly in my experience, what is initially is a simple spiral or two-part fracture. When it comes to the elderly, these are all massively multifragmentary, and there's no way that you're going to be able to get it anatomical. anatomical. Also, those lag screws, you depend so long, put them into sore bone, we see the AO juice. It probably doesn't happen as well in osteoporotic bone, and I'm not sure that the compression that you've got across these. And then the other thing is the biology, all right? So in order to get this x-ray, it's all been opened up, it's all been stripped, and we've also just damaged all the sort of its healing potential. It's pretty rigid with some lock screws. So can we predict what's going to happen? Well, probably we can do. 
So this is just simply a loss of race against time. So distal femurs are going to take a long time to heal and that plate is not gonna be sufficient uh, in order for the bone to heal. Is it just this construct of lag screws and distal plating? Well, no, because it, it happens quite a lot. Different strategy here done elsewhere. Plate may be done by not opening the fracture used in bridge mode. And I don't think it's whether you, how you use the plate. I just don't feel that a single lateral plate is really winning your race against time. And you need a construct that's going to last a bit longer in order to let your bone heal. Your bone will heal. You just need metalwork to be a bit, uh, a bit stronger. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is to move away from nailing or plating. And I think that if traffic started again, I don't think that we'd all have, uh, we'd all be able to enter into it because we don't do nails anymore. We don't do plates anymore. Uh, we don't do frames anymore. We're quite often using all three different techniques because each bit of that hardware is doing something slightly different for that particular fracture pattern. So the solution is more metal works so are gonna last a little bit longer as a nail plate construct. Well. Does it work? This is just our series having a look with uh, 40 plates versus 28 nails and plates. And you can see that the nails and plates were better in terms of metalwork failure and union. But I think the key message from this, and you guys were so honest on your survey about with the case with the periprosthetic, would some of your post-op instructions involve non-weight bearing? And the majority of you said yes. So we all go around at the meetings and we put our hands up. Yeah, we're aggressive. Of course, we weight bear them all, but secretly we don't. We still secretly are hoping we're right, touch weight bearing, get away with it. But with your nail plate construct, that's going to give us as surgeons as a little bit more confidence to weight bear our patients. And we know that's what patients need. We would never do that for neck of femur. And the distal femur is really no different. So nail plate construct is going to give you a more confidence to weight bear your patient early. So we're needing our metal work to last longer. This is now just a few technical tips. I like to do the, I say the retrograde nail first, and I do my nailing in exactly the same way that, that Pete just described. You can either go for a relatively longer nail uh, and a shorter plate, it's difficult to get your proximal locking around. So my preference now is to move to a slightly shorter nail and a longer plate for a bicortical fixation at the top. And if I'm doing a nail plate construct, I tend to do my distal locking through the nail from a medial side, just so if I ever have to do have to remove the nail, I can do so without removing the plate. Uh, there are some advantages, pros and cons of everything, as there is in, in surgery. You can do your distal locking from the lateral side, and certainly that stops your locking screws backing out because your plate's acting as a buttress. But I say my preference is to go from the medial side. And I tend to use screws so I can get variable angle screws and then plate around it as opposed to using a spiral blade. However, I take uh, Greg's point, if you're using a spiral blade with an end cap, you're going to give yourself a, a fixed construct. But the problem is, is arthroplasty, isn't it? All the arthroplasty is they love putting these knee replacements. And this is the case that was presented online. I think the majority of you said, look, this is a simple fracture pattern. So I'm going to, to cable it, get it anatomical and do a single latching plate. But I've just said they're very, very unlikely to be simple and we don't want to open it and strip it too much. And a single lock, locking plate or whether you lock or not lock is not going to be sufficient to last long enough. So even with the Paris prosthetic, you can still do your nail and plate construct. Uh, and uh, depending on the type of knee replacement and where that knee replacement sits in terms of its flexion and extension. Here at the top, we've used, I think these are fantastic. I'm much better at screwing than I am at, at wiring. So I'd prefer to use these locking attachment plates for bicortical small fragment screws around the nail rather than periprosthetic screws or unicortical or circlage wiring. So which knee replacements can we do it? And, and certainly I've spent a, a long time looking up all the evidence. And there's a huge amount of papers out there uh, looking at which knee replacements can you get a retrograde nail through? And they all tell you something slightly different. And of course, it's hard to keep up with it as new knees are coming out all the time. But universally, they tend to say that it's a no-go for a next gen, although I beg to differ. Uh, so this is distal femur. You can see from the middle uh, x-ray that it's spiraling down. It's a well-functioning total knee. 
And we can get a guide wire uh, through the same MEPO percutaneous approach. But you'll notice the really important thing that the entry point, and we've heard from Pete how important the entry point is, the entry point is wrong for a nail. I can get a nail through it, but a consequence of your bad entry point is if you look on the, on the far right, I've ended up with an apex posterior deformity. So it's okay, I mean, length alignment rotation, not opening, it goes on to heal, but because the entry point of the nail is wrong, you're gonna increase the deformity at the fracture. Now, fortunately, there are some new technologies on the horizon, these periprosthetic nails with an increased 10 degree curve, which are gonna allow for a most more posterior entry point. And I really do think this is gonna push now what total knees you can nail, about, uh, nail through. This is a, as a washer uh, known as the locking attachment washer. I'm, I'm desperately trying to beat Pete to be the first one to use it. And Ennis, uh, Greg probably already has. And this may mean that for those ones that aren't quite so distal, that we can be using this instead of the full lateral plate. Right, so does it all go to plan? Well, absolutely not. This is pushing the indications for what's nailable. Um, I thought, well, I can probably nail that. We know it goes into the joint. We can fix the joint first and then pop a nail through. I didn't de do that. I was very horrified when the nail still came out through the trochlea. And I thought, well, I better not leave it like that. So what's the plan B? Is my plan B still my single lateral plate? Well, no, I don't, I don't want to do that because I know 40% are going to fail. So then I move to a, a lateral plate, but instead of supplement with a nail, with a medial plate. Now, currently, for uh, where, where I'm working, we don't have a, a pre-contoured medial plate. Of course, you can use a straight LCP, but you may only get one or two screws in your distal fragment. And sometimes the fracture pattern is not really amenable to buttressing. So we did a little bit of work, working out which plate sits on the bone. And we've realized that it's the ipsilateral, the same side, lateral proximal tibial plate is the one up until about 12 centimeters that fits quite predictably without any lift off with a lot of screws distally. So that, that's me coming to the end. So what, what do I want you to take away from it? Well, I want you to take away that actually a single lateral plate for elderly distal femurs is really not enough. You need to add it ideally with a, with a nail, uh, but if not, consider a medial plate. Early weight bearing is paramount. Don't kid yourself. Uh, be confident and do a construct that lets your patient's weight bear straight away. Don't open it. We don't want anatomical. We want length, alignment and rotation. Uh, don't worry about a next gen. I reckon you can nail through it. And, and on the horizon, there's new technology, which are going to push our indications for, for retrograde nails even more. All right, uh, so I, I guess back to, back to you, Pete. Awesome, thanks, uh, thanks, Jane. Uh, so be honest, like, cause, cause I, I totally agree with you. It was lovely to see everyone go, yeah, actually I don't, I don't actually weight bear all my patients, even though uh, a lot of people, we're, all of us are guilty of banging the gong of like elderly patients need to weight bear. And then, <laughs> and yet still, we, we, are, we are quite a conservative bunch, aren't we? So Jane, having done your two plates or your nail and plates, does the op note say weight bear as tolerated? Is that, is that what you write in, your, in the op note? Yeah, no, absolutely. And then they were all those cases were done by us as the trauma team over at Coventry. Uh, and I say there was only one case that had a nail and plate construct that the surgeon didn't write. In fact, we would just write fully weight bear. Right. Uh, Greg, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, nail plates and plate plates? So I do them. I, I do them quite often, actually. Um, I'm I'm actually doing dual plating constructs or nail plate constructs, and excuse me, some younger patients who have <coughs> substantial amounts of metaphyseal comminution uh, about their distal femur fractures. So, um, but yeah, it's I, I I think it's been fantastic. I've had too many distal femur fracture, early failures and fracture non-unions come to me in Barris uh, from elsewhere that they would have been salvaged, I believe, probably by a second plating construct placed medially or by a nail. And, uh, and I am letting them all weight bearers tolerated immediately. Ennis, can you just clear this one up for me? Um, you know, the, the, the idea of a lateral locking plate or indeed a nail when we, you're teaching on an AO course it, or a bridging plate, a plate in bridging mode, is that you get a, a relative stability. You've got a bit of movement at the fracture side and that produces callus. 
what on earth are we getting with a plate nail or a plate plate construct? What kind of stability is it? Relative? Is it still relative because it's the bone? The bone still has a bit of give in it. What 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 do I what do we teach our students? Yeah, and I, I think it's still relative stability because you're you're still bridging the fracture. You've just got a, a stronger metal construct. Your race against time is is slightly more in your favour um, for those convoluted fractures. I mean, I think I think the mistake often comes with. Uh, apart from the weight bearing issue about what you write in the actual op note, uh, I think the other issue is how much people are opening up the fractures. So to get proper secondary bone healing and callus, we, we need to avoid opening the fracture. So no lag screws, no, no kind of wandering around and just trying to reduce it a bit semi-open. You know, you really want to try and do all percutaneous so you maximise your biology. Uh, Jane, uh, something you brought up there, and there's been a, bit, a few questions around this, around uh, where your, your nail... So you were you were saying you're going from a fairly shortish nail and a longish plate. Uh, what what was it that took you to that uh, uh, that rather than a longish nail and a shortish plate? Presumably you're trying to protect as much of the femur as possible. Absolutely. So I think whatever you go for, you want to go for as long a, a fixation to span the whole femur as you can do. If you go for a very very long nail and you alluded it to it in your retrograde nailing top, it makes your AP locking actually quite challenging. Uh, because especially if you're cut a big belly, sometimes the belly is getting in the way. Yeah. But then your screws on your lateral plate, you're going to have to do something slightly differently. You're either going to have to angle them around the nail or use a locking attachment plate. Whereas if you just stop your nail a little bit shorter, your plate's going to go up to the GT, not so much that you have to contour it round. And then you're just going to open up that bit and you've got four bicortical screws just done no problem. And yet your AP locking is slightly easier on your retrograde nail. Yeah. Uh, Srinath uh, Ranjit's asking uh, that, that, that question that's kind of on everyone else's lips is, is will the next generation of nails, and we know J&J's bought one out and I'm sure the other companies will follow, but um, bring out ones that have more stability in the block. They've got, like, as you say, Greg, they've got bits of plastic in the, in the things that's turned into uh, fixed angle screws. Plus you've got bolts that sandwich on the side. Plus you've got that accessory plate that Jane talked about. Is that gonna get us past the nail plate thing, do we think? Or do we, we, I guess we just don't know, do we? I don't think it will with the fragility fractures, but I swear I see that sort of locking washer coming in would be for the distal femurs in young people where you need a little bit of extra fix, but maybe you don't want to go to, a, to the whole uh, long lateral plate. Greg, you buying that? Yeah, I agree. I, um, I'm, I, I apologize, I didn't hear everything because I'm writing some answers to some questions here, but yeah, I don't, I, I think that, uh, I think that the, I, if we really think about the idea of doing laterally based lock plating, we're talking about asking these plates to act as a tension band types of constructs. And in order for tension band to function properly, you have to have a uh, good cortical contact on the opposite side. Uh, and in this case, not only do we have really poor bone, because the quality stinks, uh, because the patient's elderly, but also half the time there's a bunch of comminutions, so you just can't rely on that. So it, it, it almost doesn't matter how, how wonderful of a newfangled construct, some next generation super plate that goes on, I still suspect we're still gonna need to provide support elsewhere. Great. All right. Uh, uh, someone's asking about a fer distal femoral tome fix. Uh, uh, I've, I've got no, that's a, that's a, a, an osteotomy tool, isn't it? I, I've not used that myself. It is quite a robust plate, but uh, uh, that, that's, it's, it's a very rigid construct, I would say. Um, uh, Thanks again for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. And, uh, uh, it, and it's always a pleasure to work with some, uh, the panelists who are absolutely exceptional, but also it's a real privilege to be able to speak with individuals who are really interested in, uh, in fixing these terrible injuries uh, the way I do. Uh, at the end of the day, remember when, we, when you've seen a couple of crazy x-rays um, and maybe poorly executed surgeries, let's, uh, let's always remember that uh, aside from the shock value of, of x-rays that are shown from poorly done surgeries, remember that there's a living human being that's attached to that x-ray. And so it really behooves us to do as good a job as we can with the resources that we have. So, so I'm gonna talk about intraarticular distal femur fractures and there is way too much to talk about uh, in even if I spent the entire time, so I won't do that. Um, but uh, what we'll do is we'll just talk about a little bit of, a little bit of the uh, 
treatment goals of anatomic reduction of articular segments, and then restoration of the articular surface back to the rest of the distal femur, which means length alignment and rotation and doesn't mean putting them together like puzzle pieces. The goal is to allow early range of motion and ideally to allow early weight bearing if you can. And then this is the thing that we've been uh, touching on and uh, that we went through Ms. Ward's talk uh, thinking about is ways to prevent varus collapse uh, that can happen after isolated laterally based locking, uh, lock plating constructs. So the take home points I'd like you to have are that, uh, first of all, the distal femur has a very unique geometry and anatomy. And so we need to respect that. And I'll mention that as it's relevant to where we place our implants. We wanna get our articular reduction in an anatomic position. And then we want to get correct axial alignment when we're reattaching the articular surface to the shaft. Finally, we wanna make sure we understand our implants so we know what they do for us, but then what they also shouldn't be asked to do for us. The distal femoral geometry is, it's really trapezoidal if you look at it from an axial, uh, from an axial standpoint. And then what you find is that there's some internal rotation, so to speak, of the lateral surface of the distal femur by about 10 degrees. So what you need to recognize is that when you're putting your plate on, it's gonna sit internally rotated a little bit at the distal femur. You want, the main reason to consider this is first of all, that most of the anatomical plates that have been created uh, are designed to match this. But if you, as the surgeon, put the plate in the wrong location, you can induce a deformity that uh, can be really problematic for the patient uh, and for future surgeries that might need to happen on account of a malreduction. You also need to recognize that the distal femur sits relatively posterior relative to the axis of the femoral shaft. And you can see here in the more central illustration that the path of, a, of an intramedullary nail ends up really close to the junction between the anterior third and the, dis and the posterior two thirds of the distal femur. And so if you're gonna be putting a plate on the distal femur on the lateral side or on the medial side, I would say, then you want to consider the fact that the plate needs to be sitting more anterior than you might think, it should not be central. And if you look in the lower right hand corner, you can see the small shaded box that's labeled W which would be the insertion point for an angled blade plate. Notice that is sitting anteriorly relative to the femoral condyles. That's really important. If you place it too posterior, then you end up with a bunch of different issues. So if you take the, this is an example of a, of a plastic bone model where a distal femur fracture has been fixed with, a, with an angled blade plate, and you can see that the plate has been placed too posterior and then just like the surgeon would do, the plate is reduced to the shaft of the femur and look what's happened. You've translated the distal femur anteriorly. And then you have to think about this. If you place your plate too posterior, it ends up pushing against the lateral epicondyle. And then your plate, which is designed to sit somewhere different from where you've placed it, will drive the distal femur medially and what this ends up with is you can call it whatever you like, whether it's a golf club deformity or a hockey stick deformity, it's a real problem. And you can see this ends up uh, causing a real issue with distal femur deformity. So you don't wanna do that. So make sure you know where you're placing your, your plate. We wanna counteract deforming forces. And this is really what we're doing when we're achieving our metaphyseal reduction, right? We wanna think about the things that are, that are creating deformity at the fracture. And primarily the big thing, and we've already seen some examples of placing towel bumps beneath the apex of the fracture to resist the pull of the gastrocnemius. What those, what those towel bumps are doing are not only reducing the apex of the fracture, but they're also allowing the knee to flex, which relatively relaxes the gastrocnemius and helps to keep it from pulling the distal femur into an extension type of deformity like you see here. And there are lots of surgical approaches that we can use. The key is that when we address high energy intraarticular distal femur fractures that we get our exposure of the distal femur articular surface so that we can see what it is that we're doing and we can put things together. So your fracture pattern ultimately is gonna determine the type of approach that you use and if you use more than one approach. You have to think about other things as well. What kind of reduction techniques are we going to use? Direct reduction techniques are most often used for articular surfaces. 
but indirect reduction, such as use of uh, femoral distractors or other longitudinal traction techniques uh, are used for metaphyseal reconstruction and realignment. We wanna think about whether we're imparting absolute or relative stability to the fracture segments. And then we wanna think about based on what our goals are for the various parts of the fracture, then that helps us determine what kind of a surgical dissection and a surgical approach we're going to use. And then of course, this gives us an idea of what implant we're going to choose. And choosing the implant should be the last thing that you do. It would be, it would be best if you didn't choose the implant and then make your surgical plan based on the implant that you have unless it's the only implant that's available, in which case, and in many cases, that, that may be required. So we'll speak about articular reduction here. And there are lots of articular fracture patterns, obviously. And so this is how I would consider approaching it. And I'll have a few photographs of some uh, plastic bone models here where you can get access to the medial femoral condyle. And that's probably the first place to start if you notice that you have medial condyle fractures. You can get access through a parapatellar approach. The type of approach that I would tend to use for highly comminuted intraarticular fractures is a variant of a lateral approach where I'm making a lateral parapatellar uh, incision deeply and then making my arthrotomy just adjacent to the lateral aspect of the patella. If you don't like that concept because you would prefer to stay on the medial side of the patella, that's probably reasonable, but that would just entail a second incision where you make a midline incision to make your medial parapatellar approach. And then you make a separate lateral incision for insertion of your laterally based plate. And that's perfectly acceptable. Just be aware again of where you need to get and then make your incisions accordingly. So, but you can get access to the posterior condyle uh, on the medial side, as you see here. You can also consider doing a subvastus approach medially to improve your visualization if needed for the medial side. For the lateral condyle fragment, otherwise termed the Hoffa fragment, you should be able to address this through your lateral incision, right? And just remember that in order to get to this very often, you need to flex the knee, but recognize that when you flex the knee, it can drive the posterior lateral condylar fracture fragment proximally. So you need to be aware that although it may improve your visualization slightly, it could also accentuate your fracture deformity and you need to work against that. And then what we want to do is we want to recognize that once we've got our posterior condyles reduced, we want to get the lateral and the medial condyles together. So how do we do that? So how do we reduce the intercondylar split? Well, this is the standard way that we think about it, right? So we'll place a clamp or multiple clamps onto the, later, onto the medial and lateral sides of the femoral condyles and just clamp them together. And you are looking at the anterior femur in general when you're doing this. And here's the problem. So you look at that anterior femur and it looks pretty righteous. It looks like it's been really nicely reduced. However, if you look axially, you'll notice that the fracture is gapped in the posterior aspect of the distal femur. And that's a real problem. Now, how do you see that? You can't see that with your eyes. So you get your uh, fluoroscope or your image intensifier or II, I think you all like to call it. Um, you get your image intensifier in and you take a femoral notch view, which is a similar view that many knee reconstruction surgeons will do prior to performing knee arthroplasty. And you can see the gapping that occurs at the roof of the notch that you can clearly see here on this plastic bone model. And so if you see that, then uh, you need to do something about it. So you don't just accept it and leave it there. You achieve your reduction by a more strategically placed clamp or more than one clamp to be able to get your fracture reduction correct. Now, remember what we're not showing here is that one or both condyles may be malrotated as well. And so you need to really pay careful attention to make sure you're not flexing or extending one of the condyles relative to the other. And sometimes it can, be, it can, it, it can fool you. So you have to pay very close attention to, you, to what you visualize. The next thing we're gonna work on now that we've got our fractures uh, reduced and we're going to fix them with screws generally that are placed along the articular margins so that we leave room for either our plate or our nail or both that we're going to be putting on. Uh, then we're going to achieve our metadiaphyseal reduction and we do this by paying attention to the overall length, alignment, and rotation. We've heard about a great method of uh, checking rotation after reducing for during retrograde nailing. We heard that from Pete a little while ago. 
uh, measuring length. There are lots of ways to do this, um, but in general, um, this, these are the goals that we have. And then finally, you wanna make sure you know your implant. Know exactly where things are needed to be placed. So if you look at the left-hand diagram here, this is, a, this is a, a basic distal femur plate that's available in the United States and probably in many, many other countries. But notice that there is a clamp anteriorly on the condyles, but you also see a couple of places where either wires or screws have been placed. They are very, very close to the articular margin. And the goal here is that you're keeping those screws, often those are screw heads that you'd be staring at there. Those screw heads, you don't want them interfering with where your plate is being positioned. But you want to make sure you're putting the plate in the correct location. You can see on the right-hand side, this is a template that is used by another implant manufacturer that can be used to figure out where you would like to place your plate. So remember, you want your, you want your implant ultimately to be placed properly on the articular segment. Okay, and then you can line it up to the shaft. If you place it improperly on the articular segment and then you realign the plate to the shaft, then you will malreduce the metaphysis, okay? And in general, uh, some people talk about summation wires being placed. So if you look in the right-hand corner, you can see there are four small Kirshner wires, but then there is a larger threaded guide wire that has been placed through the distal aspect of this template. And notice that it is basically been designed, it's been designed to be parallel to the femoral condyles distally. So approximately a 95 degree angle relative to the femoral shaft. And on the left-hand view, you see that the anterior aspect of the template being used here is more or less parallel to the anterior cortex of the distal femur. Now remember, again, like I just got done saying, implant insertion into the reconstructed articular block will determine your alignment. So if you put it in the wrong place, then you're going to misalign the fracture. This is what it should look like. So this is a blade plate that's been used. Notice there are no locking screws. So you don't need to place locking screws everywhere. This is obviously a fixed angle construct, which is what locking plates were designed to be as well, but all portable screws otherwise up the shaft. So we don't need locking screws generally in the shaft unless the bone quality is terrible. And then sometimes you can actually use some of these plates to drive your reduction. So if you really have substantial difficulties with figuring out where the bone needs to go, you can use the plate to help you. However, if you put the plate in the wrong place, it's going to drive your malreduction. So try to avoid that. And this is what something might look like when all is said and done. These aren't easy. So in general, uh, for high energy distal femur fractures, but in reality, for any interarticular distal femur fracture, these are things you want to think about. The distal femur geometry and anatomy are fairly unique and you need to pay attention to the anatomy with regard to reduction, but also with regard to where you place your plates or any of your implants. The goal is anatomic articular reduction with ideally absolute stability at the articular surface. We want to achieve the correct axial alignment, which means restoration of length, alignment, and rotation, ideally doing this through indirect methods. And then understanding your implant of choice is probably the most important thing because that is what you're going to do to hold things together once you've gotten them expertly placed into the correct position. Thanks very much. Awesome job, Greg. <clears throat> uh, uh, one of the questions on the Q&A, which I, I love the directness of it, was why do, why do we need to be weight bearing these patients fully? And uh, I responded on the chat that uh, in the geriatric population, uh, we're trying to we're trying to obviate a sarcopenia, muscle wasting, pressure sores, uh, you know, vulnerability to, to respiratory tract infections, et cetera, et cetera. But in the younger population, let's say in a 20 year old, do we really care about early weight bearing? Is it a big deal? In fact, should we be avoiding that in order that they can they don't go on to deform or break their implants or whatever? So, uh, sorry, Ennis, Ennis, you had your hand up. So please. Sorry. please. Oh, sorry, I, I was just saying, I mean, I think in the younger patient, the you know, unless you've got an intra-articular fracture, which you're trying to protect, um, it really doesn't matter. And not weight bearing the patient is not what saves your implant. Uh, I, I truly believe that it, failure is gonna occur irrespective of what you do with weight bearing in a non-articular fracture. 
So if you haven't fixed it properly, whether you wait bear them at two weeks or at two months, it's still going to fail. Yeah, so as an extension to what he's saying, I, I, I would ask if we're going to limit weight bearing for these younger patients, how long should we do that? I mean, should we do it for, I, I've, had, I've heard surgeons say, oh, we should just limit them for two weeks. So I, I, to which my response is, okay, so how much bone healing do you anticipate happening during those yeah. two weeks? Right. So, so although, although you're right, I mean, I guess that the, the young and hale 20 year old who is perfectly capable of using crutches can protect their weight bearing for months if needed. That's perfectly fine. But I mean, does it do, why, why would we need to do that? If you do a good job with the surgery, you stabilize the fracture appropriately, uh, patients are going to, they're going to auto regulate their weight bearing based on how they feel. Um, so why not just let them weight bear to tolerance? And you know, if they tolerate it really well because you did a great job with your reduction in fixation, then that's a home run. Okay, so you can just let them go. And if they can't tolerate it, maybe they'll they'll just use the crutches because it hurts a little bit. And then when they don't hurt anymore, then they'll get rid of their crutches. Yep. Uh, so Greg, just to just to be absolutely clear on that, you your reduction, your you, you, uh, you I think you're doing what I what I do, which is uh, do two approaches to these things. Your your reduction to the joint is medial parapetella, and then to get your plate in, you're doing a fairly smallish uh, lateral approach direct onto the anterolateral condyle to put your plate on. Is that is that is that have I got that right? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes I'll do it that way, but sometimes I use, there's a, there's a surgical approach that was popularly termed, at least in the United States, a swashbuckler approach by yeah. uh, the UT Southwestern in Dallas, uh, which is really, it's a single skin incision and it really looks like a basic lateral approach, but you then flap the skin up and then you perform a lateral parapetellar approach and then carry the fascial incision along the lateral margin of the vastus lateralis, and then incise the iliotibial band with it. So it becomes one incision where you have sufficient access laterally to position your plate, but you also have sufficient access anteriorly to be able to both reduce and fix your articular segments. Um, so I'll, I'll use that sometimes. I don't have any problem with making two incisions. Um, and I, I, I will mix and match these surgical approaches based upon what I see as the fracture pattern and what I've interpreted. And also, <laughs> and sometimes based upon the quality and skill of the trainees with whom I'm working. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Ennis, I think we're with you. Bone loss. We've already had some stuff on the chat about, you know, what do we do about bone grafting? Do you ever bone graft acutely? When do you put in cement? So uh, over to you, buddy. All to become clear. Yeah, thanks, Pete. I mean, this is a, a great topic for discussion and uh, we're going to ramp it up a little bit more now with um, the intraarticular distal femoral fractures, but now with some bone loss and how, how do we manage it? Um, I think it's important to remember that these are often really complex fracture patterns in young patients, often due to high energy injuries. They're um, often open um, and they're often in multiply injured patients. So you have to consider your timing of surgery, your rehabilitation. So the question about weight bearing, for example, in the younger patient, often then if they've got both limbs injured and an upper limb injury, then actually limiting their weight bearing on their leg may not be particularly helpful. So you may want to think about weight bearing for that reason as well. Um, so I thought the best way would be to illustrate with a couple of cases because um, these are difficult fractures to, um, to find much evidence or literature about. So the first case is a 51 year old um, chap, motorbike versus car. He has an open right distal femoral fracture, which you can see here in the, in the photo. Um, also has a closed right pilon fracture, a left knee dislocation, a uh, left intraarticular distal radial fracture and a right ulnar shaft fracture. So the question here is obviously timing of surgery, finding the appropriate surgeon for the different parts of the body, um, and then thinking about the patient's rehab and their um, post-operative course. But with regards to this um, intraarticular right distal femoral fracture, um, you can see here from the radiographs, 
And as Jane pointed out earlier, often CT scans aren't particularly helpful because it's just very bad. <laughs> um, and my first consideration is what's my surgical approach going to be um, with these? And I often pick an approach that enables you to adequately visualize a joint and also plan for any further surgery in the future. So often it's an anterior approach with these cases. Um, and you can see from the photo there. And then the first thing is adequate debridement. So any loose fragments, devitalized fragments, non-critical um, parts of the uh, convolution can be discarded, obviously not the condyles. Um, and then once you've done a thorough debridement, it's in the case of reconstructing the joint. Um, and they're using uh, the techniques that Greg's explained um, by uh, headless compression screws for any Hoffer fragments. Um, and then the difficulty is trying to realign the condyles. Um, and as pointed out earlier, sometimes if there's trochlear bone loss, getting your um, condyles not over reduced is, is tricky. Um, maintaining the width of your um, condyles is, is important. Um, so you really sometimes have to make a, a, a call on the table as to where you think the reduction is. And then I hold that with a clamp and then put some position screws to hold the condyles together. Having done that, uh, and then thinking about the bone loss uh, at the metaphyseal diaphyseal region, um, and what I'll then do is span the bone loss with a retrograde femoral nail, um, often using the diathermy wire as a kind of guide for your alignment, which can help. Um, and then once the nails are across, I then often use cement as my sort of structural support um, for the bone void. Uh, it acts as a useful um, void filler as well. And then it also serves as your first stage for your emasculate technique. So then that means coming back and doing bone grafting as a second stage. So that's my normal go-to for these types of injuries. And that's the condyles reconstructed and the bone loss taken care of. And the great thing about this is that you can then close it and then you can get the patient walking, rehabilitating. I do fully weight bear. So this patient was fully weight bearing straight away. And then once they've recovered from all their other injuries and fractures, you can then think about your bone loss and how you're going to manage it. So in this case, I've, you can see from the photo on the left, I've done a lateral approach for my second stage masculine and I've used bone graft. Unfortunately, as you can see from the radiogra radiographs on the right, uh, the masculine hasn't worked and the bone grafting hasn't incorporated and consolidated. Um, with this particular case, at the initial operation, I'd shortened him two centimeters. So what I decided to do for the bone loss in this um, scenario was to lengthen him with a retrograde lengthening nail. Um, so I pre-distracted it to um, uh, the, the lengthening nail, inserted it as a retrograde nail, and then lengthened my non-union by two centimeters. And that's brought him out to equal leg lengths. And then I've done an osteotomy above the lengthening nail, dual plated again to allow weight bearing straight away, and then turn the um, magnets around on the handheld device and now doing bone transport by dragging the femur back down to the condyles um, and um, his weight bearings throughout this, uh, the, uh, th throughout the whole bone transport stage. And this is his overall journey. It's a four year process, um, but you can see with the final radiographs, he's got good regenerate, which is consolidated. His docking site has united and he didn't need any docking site procedures. And you can see him rehabilitate, rehabilitated and walking quite, quite nicely there. So I think this technique in these difficult cases allows for, it's still a long process for the patient, but it allows them to rehabilitate, rehabilitate and return to work much sooner. So a second similar case, just to illustrate um, a similar sort of theme. This was um, a code red patient with open bilateral intraarticular distal femoral fractures, as well as a closed right tibial fracture a closed uh, right Montegia elbow fracture dislocation, an intraarticular fracture of the other elbow, as well as a first metatarsal fracture. The left distal femur is the worst one. Um, and you can see here from the CT slices, again, it has a, a half a fragment. The um, fracture fragments are flipped uh, and it's multi-fragmentary in the metaphyseal diaphyseal region, as well as being open. So similar sort of technique, um, open midline approach, um, restore the condyles, um, fix the condyles back to each other, and then a retrograde femoral nail with a cement spacer for structural stability. You can see here I'm slightly malaligned, um, as mainly due to the, the severe lack of bone in the distal femur. Um, but again, for the, for the early stages of this patient's recovery, 
Um, it allows them to, to, to start rehabilitating their knee quite quickly. Um, and then with this case, what I've decided to do is a slightly different technique, mainly because of the uh, um, poor masculine technique on the last case. So I've used the bone transport nail um, as my, my second stage for this bone loss. So this is an antegrade bone transport nail. Uh, I've used a lateral femoral locking plate to correct my alignment uh, and also to give me some extra stability because again, you can see from those intraoperative x-rays how, how little distal femur there is. Having inserted the uh, nail, you then do a corticotomy above the transporting segment. And then I've used um, synthetic bone graft in the distal fragment um, just to help with my docking site union um, when it comes down to dock. And this is her progression. So you can see the radiograph showing the bone transport distally um, with regenerate forming at the top, which goes on to consolidate quite nicely. And again, her final radiographs um, and her weight bearing. I think this technique actually is a slightly quicker process because it um, um, uh, allows for the bone transport all in one um, and mitigates the, the requirement for masculine for such a long segment. Um, and these are sort of the two go-to techniques I, I would personally pick for distal femurs with bone loss. So in summary, I think it's really important to recognize these are complex fractures um, with complex fracture patterns. You need a good visualization, visualization of the joint. Um, you need to consider the whole patient in your management and their whole rehab um, due to the other fractures that they often uh, have at the same time. And I think using modern internal fixation techniques it allows for us to, to, to rehabilitate and return to early function. Back to you, Pete. Cheers, Ennis. <clears throat> that, was, that was lovely. Um, I guess the first thing that, 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 that uh, jumps into my head in terms of a, an obvious question is, how do you have any advice to your colleagues on how to temporize these injuries? So let's take that first one you said, massive, uh, you know, condyles are like this. There's a, maybe there's a bit, a bit of hoffer as well going on and this extensive metaphyseal comminution. And your colleague rings you up and says, Ennis, what do you want me to do with this? What's your answer? What, how do I temporize this situation? So I, I think in the first stage is an external fixator, you know, just to, to, to hold the bone out to length. Um, if there, so that first case, I don't know if you noticed, there were some skin clips. Okay. So that had actually been debrided already. So that was the post first debridement. Understood. Yeah. Um, so that so that had been poorly managed at the first stage. Uh, I think either way. So as long as there, as long as there's some uh, length um, and uh, early debridement, then that's fine. And then we can then manage um, manage that once they've got over their code red and they've they've physiologically then been restored. So yeah. I think in the early stage um, debridement, temporary stabilization. Um, and then and do, you, do you ask your colleagues to put uh, blocks of cement in with with antibiotic laden cement or, or anything like that? Uh, so, my preference, simple. so my preference would be to keep it simple. Um, I think some form of uh, void filler is useful to prevent that hematoma and, and um, uh, 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 environment for bacterial growth. Um, so they can put a temporary cement block in just as, a, as an initial stage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think it depends on how well they think they're going to do their debridement. Yeah. A question from the Q&A was, uh, is there ever a scenario where you might bone graft someone acutely? Um, my, so personally, no. Um, I think as well as everything else, it's then too much to, 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 to consider. Um, I think until you've got a stable soft tissue environment um, and until you've got control of your, your, your sort of fracture, um, I think bone grafting acutely is, is difficult. I mean, one could talk about sort of uh, free fibulas or, or sort of free bone transfers. Um, again, I think in the, with the soft tissue environment, I think that they, 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 that would be difficult ask in that sort of first stage. Um, I think this sort of technique allows weight bearing, gets them through that first stage, and then you can consider the bone grafting as a, as a secondary procedure. Yep. Jane, uh, are, are you guys doing masculine up in Coventry? What's your, what's your go-to for restoring bone? Are you, are you having a go at masculine? I think I've come uh, full circle. Like uh, I've certainly had a few cases, like, like uh, Ennis's 
when we tried Masculay to start with and have uh, absolutely failed spectacularly, if I'm honest. And they've ended up with distal femurs, which is also not the answer either. So my own views about Masculay are that if it's not a, if it's a contained defect, so you've got one posterior cortex and certainly for the distal tibial metaphysis, it sometimes can work okay. But for the distal femur, when it's a full segmental defect, I think Masculay alone without like Ennis's technique of doing a transport now probably isn't, isn't sufficient. Um, I find problems with the docking site always. So I think using the transport now is a brilliant idea which sort of has led us now to is all that, all that bone that you've just thrown in the bin is, is do, do we need to do that? Yeah. A great question. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Ennis, there are two things there. Um, uh, why is masculase so uh, user dependent? Because some people absolutely love it and they're reporting great, great uh, uh, outcomes. And they say, this works in my hands most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time. And other people are saying this, this has never worked for me. What, why is that? Uh, so I, it's technique, I think, mainly. Um, uh, the important points to remember are in putting the cement spacer in, you have to put a large amount of cement to create a big volume for your when your membrane forms. Uh, I think it works better with a nail rather than a plate. Um, and I think when you come to your second stage, um, decorticating the bone and making the bone ends healthy um, and then having a, a decent membrane, which you can then sew over the top, I think increases your success rate. Um, so I think it really starts from that first operation. I've, uh, I've found masculine that's been done as a kind of, as an aside at the end of the operation, someone puts in cement and then hands it over to me to then manage. Uh, the membrane is often not a good, a, a, of good quality and the volume is quite small. Um, yeah. so I think the key is really that first stage is quite critical. Greg, any, any thoughts on masculine? Uh, it, it, it works in your hands, doesn't work in your hands. Um. The answer to both questions is yes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, I, I, it's it's totally technique dependent, and uh, there there you have to think of other things as well, such as who the host is, uh, right? So some some patients are just not going to, some patients aren't going to do very well with it. Some other ones who are younger and healthier and have really good tissue beds might do better. Um, so I've had variable success with it. It seemed to be okay in my hands, um, but I think I think the people that are running into trouble probably most often are attempting to really push the limits of the bone defects that they are treating with this type of technique. And, and I don't think we've had it quite figured out. So uh, I would love to spend some time with people who are filling 15 centimeter defects in a femur uh, with a masculine technique, because I'd love to see them do that. Uh, and I'd love to see their clinical follow up of that. But um, I think using the transport nails is just a sensational idea. I have, I don't do that personally, but I have a partner here who does. Um, uh, using circular frames for transport are fine too, but patients generally absolutely despise those. So especially on the femur. But um, yeah, I, I do, I do a fair bit of masculine technique, but uh, I, I can't say as to the fact that it's always super reliable the way some of the super fans will say. Yeah, uh, we've, we've, we've had some answers, uh, uh, questions from the Q&A about Elizaroff technique, which I guess a nail is Elizaroff technique, it's just not using the, a, a frame. Uh, are we, are we uh, has, the, has the nail, particularly in the femur, has the nail completely wiped out the X-Fix or the, the, the Elizaroff frame? Yeah, I mean, my, my I think I mean, patients hate frames and patients hate frames on the femur even more. Um, I think the lengthening nail has really revolutionized that aspect. Uh, and certainly in the femur, I think the, the, the place for the a frame is, is, is diminishing. Right. Right, okay. Uh, the, the, the thing that the question, another question has been asked is about is retaining bone fragments. So, uh, Ennis, I'll kick off with you and then we can all have a little pop at it. I, I, must, say, I must say I'm not one for lagging in. Uh, let's say you've got, You've got your shaft here and you've got two large cortical fragments, one on this side, one on this side. Both of them have virtually no soft tissue. And as part of your debridement, you would normally throw those in the bin. However, you could make that one click in there and that one click in there and put some mini fragment stuff together or, or whatever you like to, to lag them back in and reconstitute some kind of shaft of femur. 
Uh, this has been popularized by the Bristol group, but I and, and other people say they do it, but I, I, I've, it's not, they're not x-rays that you commonly see. And I was just wondering what the faculty's experience of that is. Culturally, we don't do it in our institution, but uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm open to hear, hear everyone's take on it. I'll jump on in. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big fan. I've, I mean, I put my hands up and say, obviously I was trained in Bristol, they weren't doing it and I was there. And I say I've come that way because everything else I've tried hasn't really worked. Um, I've got quite a few cases now of bone I've taken out, I've washed it, I've then tucked it back somewhere else. So I was thinking, well, if the neurosurgeons, they can keep their skulls, then I'm going to just keep a little bit of tibia. So I've just tucked it under and then I've come back and I've fixed it anatomically and keyed it in a week later. And uh, I'm not talking about tiny, tiny bits of bone, as Ennis alluded to. It's sort of large, really structurally important cortical bone. Uh, and they are in terrible, terrible hosts, and it's all gone well. Um, Greg? Yeah, so, so I've, not, I've not bought into that um, myself. I, I think it's intriguing. I think the, the, uh, the, some of the stuff that is coming out of, for example, from Bristol, and I, I, I've spoken with Ms. Ward about this as well. It's, I, I mean, it's compelling. It's just really hard for me to get over the uh, the cognitive dissonance that I have with all of the <laughs> where where these pieces of bone are going into the bucket now. Um, but it does make sense, right? Uh, I mean, if we are really doing a, re a good job with debridement, then it shouldn't be a huge issue. What I have done though, is I will say, I will take large cortical fragments that I know are going to go in the bin eventually. And if I'm taking them out at the initial debridement, I might save them and actually sterilize them. I, we'll put them. We'll put them in a specimen cup and we'll put them in the autoclave and sterilize them and then hold them sterile until the definitive reconstruction. And then I can use them as puzzle pieces so I can potentially improve my reduction quality. And then once I have the fixation place, then I just take the pieces of bone out and I throw them away. So I just use them as templates almost for my reduction. But I haven't uh, gotten to the point where I'm retaining cortical bone fragments. That being said, we do it all the time for large fragments of bone that are that have articular surface and that obviously don't have soft tissue attachment. In open distal femur fractures, we do that all the time. We retain those pieces. So the by extension, we should be able to retain cortical fragments if the wounds are clean, right? But I mean, my, my main issue is the, the types of cases I find that, that it doesn't seem to be as black and white as what, you know, is made out. I mean, they even seem to be in hundreds of pieces, in which case it's not possible. Um, or I don't know, I just haven't quite found the case mix to make it a compelling reason for myself. I, I, do, I have done it. So, for example, if there's a large butterfly, which means if I remove it, I'm then looking at a 12 centimeter bone loss. Whereas if I retain it, then it's three and a half. Then I will keep the bone and, 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 and place it in place. Um, but they've often got soft tissues attached to it. So I'm kind of not a full convert. I, I, I'm yet to see enough post-op x-rays for me to convince it actually is a, re a reliable technique. Um, there are, I, you know, there are, people just don't seem to show those x-rays. <laughs> so I'm not entirely sure yet whether it's, it's true. <laughs> Uh, as with so much, yeah. <laughs> uh, guys, it is now, it's bang on 90 minutes. I was going to hold it up there and just uh, uh, call it down. I was going to give a very quick summary of just like uh, uh, some take-home message that I got from each of your talks. Is there anything else uh, you, you guys from the faculty wanted just to, to highlight? I think we've done pretty well with the Q&A and answering stuff. Um, oh, distal femur replacement. Oh, we ought to cover that. Jane, can you hit me with distal femur replacement? Where is that in the osteoporotic uh, uh, like option box? I think you have to have your surgeons there. So I don't do any arthroplasty, but obviously not every distal femur in the elderly is going to be suitable for fixation. So you have to have that option available within your unit. I think with different techniques, you can now push what you can fix. I think you have to be honest and say, well, well, you know, was the knee a good knee in the first place? And I don't want you to walk away thinking that distal femurs are the answer because when they go wrong, what is then the solution after that? We've all seen them get infected. 
we've all seen them break or loosen at the top so uh, it's certainly in our unit wouldn't be our, our go-to and we're probably using that maybe for you know you know uh, second or third stage perhaps uh, uh greg any any of your is it what's what's north america doing uh, is anyone uh publishing series of distal femur replacements for these 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 uh, things or is it just too big a call yeah, not not really yet. Uh, but the questions that are that you're asking and that the participants are asking are very good ones. The uh, and in fact, we've had a couple of um, of periprosthetic distal femur fractures above total knee arthroplasties that have gone bad rel relatively quickly, and it's really prompted a lot of thought about trying to figure out who would best benefit from a distal femur replacement at the beginning. And I, I, I couldn't agree with Ms. Ward more than uh, the fact that distal femur re replacement goes bad. Uh, there aren't a lot of good options, right? It's terrible. So, so I don't know. And I, I think the hard part is trying to figure out who would indicate. And I think those, I think that is a very, very blurry uh, set of indications. So um, it also really does depend on the, the, the surgical resources that you have at your institution. I don't do arthroplasty either. But I've got four partners who do, who who are very facile with distal femur replacement, and so and they're very very eager and willing to help for these. So, if you have those resources, it's helpful. And is, do you want to finish with that with the mic um, uh, on distal femur replacement, or is it is not really? Yeah. Um... Well, I find that there's either two, there's either the patients are too young and you really don't want to to, to give them a distal femur replacement, or if you can find an arthroplasty surgeon in my unit that will do it, then. <laughs> <laughs> They all say yes, but when it comes down to it, they 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 say no, because <laughs> they're open fractures, the risk of infection, um, and then it's just not convenient for them. And actually, the the the, the actual kind of logistics seems to be harder to overcome. So I find they're either too young or they say no. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to give you a very quick summary here, guys. Uh, we, we, we're going to uh, just um, wrapping up now. Um, but guys, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give potted summaries of, of things, of stuff that I've heard you, you talk about. And so I'm, if I'm misquoting you, interrupt me and say, well, that wasn't quite what I meant, Pete. <laughs> um, Jane started off talking about fragility fractures and what, her experience of, of failures in, in single, using single implants, particularly plates, and what's the solution for that. These are these are difficult, difficult patients because... Um, uh, because uh, you want them to get going immediately, and yet you know that a bridging plates are not good in bridging mode. In when you have a comminuted metaphyseal bone, um, uh, it, you know, the plate is eating all of it, is wearing all of that force that's going through it. Uh, Jane was talking about her plate nail constructs, about how she tends to go for a short nail, a long plate. Actually, I've not done that before, so that's that's nice. Uh, you were talking about um, also uh, getting your your the, the periprosthetic plate so you can wrap your screws around your own nail with the nail going up high. Uh, you can do it around knee replacements and, and the better uh, uh, implants coming out on, on, on the market with a bit more of a, of a distal bend are allowing us to nail through knee replacements without giving that, that kind of like apex posterior uh, kick up. Uh, we then had Greg talking about um, about the more high energy stuff, the high uh, uh, intraarticular fractures. Um, and I, I loved you talking about like distal femoral geometry and where you put your plate. If you put anatomic plates going in an anatomic plate, uh, anatomic place. And so if you put them in the wrong place, you inevitably end up like dialing in a deformity. Um, and uh, a great, it was a very nice describe. I mean, these are very simple pictures, but actually your description of what you go after, you reduce your medial condyle first, go after that. Then you can go after your lateral hoffer. And then finally, you can go after your midline split. And uh, Ennis and uh, Greg both gave a nice example of, how, you know, if you've got a simple split, it's quite easy to get it, get it looking perfect when you look down on the trochlear. But actually, all you've done is you've kind of like gapped it at the top with that Weber. And sometimes it needs a clamp a bit further down to, to clamp the back of the femur as well as the front. Ennis made the point very nicely that in this situation, when it's comminuted, the, the, the condyles don't belong together because there's a piece of trochlear missing. So actually you have to fix them maybe slot with, with, with a gaping hole in the middle. Otherwise you're going to narrow the femur down and that's no good either. So you do have to um, uh, work out where the anatomic position of these things are. 
uh, Greg went on to talk about uh, putting your implants in the right place. Look at that right hand x-ray. Look how the bottom of the blade plate or your, your femoral locking plate, whatever it is, sits slightly anterior on the distal femur. It doesn't sit bang in the middle. Otherwise, you will buy on a deformity. Uh, he made the importance of understanding your implants and understanding the implants the, the, the both the choice the, the implants you choose but also where they're supposed to go the anatomic plates so they go in a particular place finally we had uh uh ennis oh it's, I've, I've 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 nicked your slides so let's put the builds in as well uh but um uh what i liked about this talk particularly was uh, around uh referencing the condyles and sometimes they don't belong together they belong a bit further apart and you can see he's put holding screws in there to actually hold splint the, the condyles apart usually you do get some kind of reference there's usually some point which like that belongs with that but if you just clamp them together you may end up like moving bits of bone together that don't belong together uh i liked your temporizing solution which is basically uh it's a it's a, it, his his uh go-to was a retrograde femoral nail with um uh take all the bad bone out replace it with a cement spacer uh, but this doesn't have to be done at the first sitting you can just debride it Put an expanding external fixator, and then come back later to put your put your cement in and, and go for mascalay. Uh, but then he went on to say that actually, you know, when you look at, I mean, look at that patient journey, 2017 up to 2021. Like, oh my God, it's a it's a killer journey these people are on, isn't it? Um, and that's one of the things with mascalay is that. It, it does take a bit of time to, for you to know whether it's going to work or not. So if it, if it works like it works, it, it's brilliant. Now you've saved them a whole load of bone transport. But if it doesn't work, you've gobbled up a year of their life trying to make it work before going on with your transport. So it is a long journey for these patients. Uh, but uh, you showed us a really nice example of how you're lengthening over a, over a locking plate, which gives you uh, immediate stability with the plate, but it, and, and therefore that protects the mechanism inside the nail. Um, I'm probably going to stop there, guys. Is there anything else that I've missed out or that I like, like some killer points which I should have made, which I forgot? Brilliant. In that case, the last thing I would say is thank you so much to our sponsors, J&J. &J. Uh, uh, I'm really, really grateful for your support. And, uh, uh, and, and I hope this webinar has fulfilled your, your, uh, your expectations. To our faculty, thank you so much. Faculty, that you should be getting an email for a, a little uh, breakout room, not a breakout room, but a, like a separate uh, like a Zoom account. We can just have a quick chat afterwards. But to all those who've come today, thank you so much for coming. Uh, and we've been servicing the, uh, the uh, Q&A uh, uh, furiously.